whole matrix here. And so if you try to use the entropy method uh, naively, uh, you'll get a terrible bound. So the, um, the key point, though, is that this short little null vector here um, can be, uh, so um, it's actually fairly constrained. Uh, it, it can be determined. You don't need to know the whole matrix in order to figure out what, 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 uh, uh, what, what this vector is. Um, because this, right, this matrix, yeah, so this matrix has rank k minus one. Okay, because uh, no k minus one, uh, all the k minus one columns are li linearly independent. So this matrix has rank k minus one. So um, what that means, okay, so row rank equals column rank. So that means that somewhere out there, there, is, um, there are some k rows that span a k minus one dimensional space. Okay. Um, yeah, so now I can see what I said before. Okay, so because row rank equals column rank, Okay, so there exist k rows uh, from, okay, um, which, um, yeah, which span a k minus one dimensional space. Okay, so you can find k rows which, which generate um, uh, k minus one dimensional space. Um, but all these rows have to be orthogonal to x, okay? Which means that, that x is just normal. It's basically the unique normal vector to, um, to, to these k rows. Okay, so this, this null vector, okay, so there's, there's some k rows. In fact, uh, so again, if you, if you pay an entropy cost, pay another entropy cost of n choose k, uh, we can assume actually that it's the first k rows. Let's, uh, let's assume that it's the first k rows. Okay, so we can assume that the, the first k rows generate a k minus one dimensional space, and these rows already tell you what x is, okay, up to a constant. Okay, it tells you that this null vector x is actually, um, uh, is, is actually just the, uh, um, the normal, the, the, basically the unique vector, which is normal to all of these k vectors here. Okay, so this is unique up to constants. And I don't care about constants. Okay, so this x is, is not arbitrary. It is determined by the, 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 um, this block of, of the matrix. Okay, but you, you still, but even after fixing this block, you have this huge extra block of, of random of randomness that you can use. So, so once you fix once you fix x this way, yeah. So um, the point is now x once you once you fix this x um, is independent of the bottom n minus k rows. Okay, so this, this, uh, this x only depends on the, on, on, you have to pay the entry cost first to do this. Okay, but once you do this, x only depends on these rows, but is independent of all this other random stuff up down here. And so now you can bound this, this, this probability, by first of all this entry cost, times the probability that this x is orthogonal to all the remaining rows. Okay. Now, okay, but these are all independent of each other. So this is actually just the same as n choose k times the probability that x that this x is orthogonal to just one of these rows raised to the power n minus k. Okay, and um, at this point, I just use a, a very crude bound. Um, so, um, yeah. So this, the, you're, you're asking for when this dog product is, is zero, and you're, you're doing this random walk where each step, you, you, each step, you're doing a 50-50. Uh, um, you're either going adding or subtracting a number uh, with 50-50 uh, probability. So if you think about it, um, this random walk cannot possibly be any, um, cannot concentrate any more than one half, you, uh, because because every because every step will either half the time go up or half the time go down. You can't concentrate. Um, at a single point, it's probably bigger than one half. Um, 
So this is a very crude bound, but this is all I need for, for, for what I'm doing here. So um, each of these remaining rows only has at most a 50-50 chance of being orthogonal to the x that was generated by these rows. Um, and you've got n minus k of these rows. So when you put all this together, uh, what, you, what, we, what you bound things by is epsilon n, n choose k twice uh, from the entropy, and then like 2 to the minus n minus k. Okay, and this will be very small. Okay, so this, this will be small. Um, so remember, k is, k is already small. And this will be small as long as epsilon is small. Okay, if epsilon is, I don't know, less than, say, point, point 0.1 or something. Okay, because, uh, because these binomial coefficients will be a lot smaller than, these, than this exponential factor here, as long as, uh, as long as epsilon is small enough. Okay, so um, th this is how you deal with the compressible vectors. Okay. Yeah, so it, it's, a, it's a weird trick. Yeah, you have to somehow decouple the normal vector from some of the random components of, of your matrix uh, so that you can start using independence. OK. OK. All right. So. Um, Okay, so we, we can so we can now assume. Okay, so once you've done this, so we can now assume. Now assume um, that this doesn't happen. So we, we can now assume that uh, that no epsilon n of the columns are linearly dependent. Okay, so we can assume that there's no sparse relationship um, among the columns, um, and similarly, you can assume that there's no sparse relationship among the rows. So the only thing we have left to do is to understand the, the very dense um, relations between, between these, these vectors here. OK. OK, so now we go back to the singularity probability. OK, so we, we are, we're interested in the probability that uh, this uh, um, um, these n vectors have a linear dependence. Okay, and because of what we've already done, we know that we can assume now that this is a dense linear independence. Okay, so involving at least epsilon n of the, of the rows. That's like of the yeah. Okay, we can assume that there's no sparse relationship. There's only dense relationships. Okay, so as uh, as I said before, um, if n vectors have a linear dependence, then one of the vectors has to be a linear combination of the others. Um, but in fact, um, once you know that the linear dependence is not sparse, once you know that it's dense, in fact, most of the uh, uh, rows have to be a linear combination of, of the others. So once you know that there are no sparse relationships, so um, this implies that at least epsilon n of the xi are spanned by, by, by all the other vectors. OK. So um, yeah, because uh, um, as I said, I think it's, it's, it, this is even a name for this, like the Steinitz exchange lemma or something. Okay, that, 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 uh, that if you have no um, sparse relationships, then must, then you can find some k of these vectors that generate all the other ones, and k is at least uh, epsilon n, and they're independent. Uh, and so each one of these um, uh, of these k uh, vectors that you find is is is, is, generate, is, a, is generated by, by all the other ones. Okay, so um, okay, so in fact, a fair proportion of the x's are um, spanned by all the other ones, and so. Um, this, this thing I did earlier of, of restricting to a single x, let's say the last xn, and, saying, and asking if the last xn was, was spanned by, 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 all, by all the other vectors is, is not so uh, inefficient, given that, that a fair, given that so many of the xi's are actually spanned by, by, by all the other ones. So uh, the way you use that is that um, this expression, you can bound using this fact by uh, 1 over epsilon n times the sum of the probability that xi is spanned 
by everybody else, x1, xi minus 1, xi plus 1, up to xn. OK? OK, so this is just double counting, or if you like, linearity of expectation. OK, so, so this, uh, um, each, each time this event occurs, you contribute epsilon n events of this form, and so, uh, so, so this, this sum must be bigger than, than this sum here. OK, and uh, you can permute the x's. This, is, this doesn't depend on i, just by symmetry. So this is the same thing. Okay, so this is just uh, 1 over epsilon times the probability, let's say the last guy is in the span of the first n minus 1 guys. All right, which is where we were before. Okay, so uh, we now have this factor one by epsilon, but epsilon is like point 0.1, so, so this is, this is, not, this is no, no big deal here. Okay, so uh, we, we want to know that the probability of xn is, is spanned by, by, by the x1 to xn. Okay, so again, this, these vectors span some subspace uh, of dimension at most n minus 1, so we, we just choose, again, a normal vector. Now, if these vector, if the x's are not independent, there could be multiple choices for this, for this omega. But I, I don't really care. Um, it, it, um, you may have some flexibility in how to choose omega, but I don't care as long as what, whatever, however you choose omega, it only depends on these vectors and it doesn't depend on xn. Okay, so, so the, the only point is, is that omega should not depend. Okay, but that, that, that is, is clearly, you can do that since, since the conditions here do not depend on the extent. Okay, so you just arbitrarily choose uh, such an omega, and then um, this is just bounded by the probability that xn omega is zero. Okay, now, um, okay, so at this point we have to split into the sparse and non-sparse cases. Um, yeah, but, um, but actually, because we have already eliminated um, uh, linear dependence along the columns, uh, we know that that omega cannot be the uh, epsilon n maybe minus one sparse. Okay, that whatever this vector uh, you choose is, it, it can't have fewer than epsilon n minus one um, uh, non-zero entries, because if it did, omega has to be orthogonal to all of these um, to to the uh, yeah, so, so x, okay. you've got all these rows here. Okay, if omega was, was sparse, um, then the first, n, the first n minus one rows would be, um, uh, would be orthogonal to a vector of size, um, uh, of size uh, epsilon n minus one, which means that there's some linear dependence um, along the columns of, of, of this matrix, which involves only epsilon n minus one of the entries. Now, this linear relation is, is missing the, the bottom row, but you, you, can, you, can add, you can add the bottom row. This increases the rank by most one. And so, so um, the, the complete rows here will have some linear relationship of size at most epsilon n, which we have already excluded. So, um, so this doesn't actually happen. So omega must be actually quite dense. There must be epsilon n or so non-zero entries. And then, and then by the Erdős bound, uh, you get uh, yeah, 1 over epsilon times like something like 1 over root epsilon n over here. And so this is just constant. So epsilon is what, like a, a tenth. Okay, so, so this is what gives you the, the constant over root n. Okay. So, uh, all right. Yeah, so, yeah, this, basically the, the, the idea is, is, to, is to try to pin down what the normal vector is using some of the randomness of your matrix and then use the remaining randomness of, of your matrix to then get, uh, extract out some bound, uh, which is non-trivial. But it's not a great bound. Okay, so previously we were getting exponentially strong bounds. Here it's just the one over root n. It's, 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 it's not so strong. Um, and the main bottleneck is our use of the um, erdős schlitwood offered uh, inequality, okay, um, which, uh, just to remind you, Yeah, so OK, 
Okay, we were using the bound that, that the probability that, that a random wall concentrates to a point, like zero, is bounded by only by one of a square root of the number of non-zero entries. So this is the Erdős bound, and in a sense it is sharp, because as I said, if, if, uh, if um, you had k non-zero entries and they're all equal, um, they're all equal to one, say, then uh, you actually do attain this bound. Um, so th you know, in some sense, this bound is, is optimal. But in practice, um, you can use more sophisticated estimates. Uh, if the omegas are not equal, um, then you, it turns out that, that you can do better than this. Uh, for example, if you have k non-zero entries and they're all different, um, then it turns out that this one over root k improves, I think, to one over k to the three halves. Um, and um, in fact, you know, like for, for, for most omegas, you know, like if you pick n real numbers at random, um, just generically, if you pick n real numbers at random, they should have no linear relationships between them whatsoever. And in fact, this probability would, would, should be like two to the minus n, should be exponentially small. In, in, um, uh, in, in N. So it turns out that for most omegas, uh, you can actually improve this number by quite a bit. Um, that there are some exceptional omegas for which uh, that doesn't happen, but you can show that they're rare by sort of a more complicated version of these arguments. So uh, yeah, so there's, there's, there's a whole sequence of papers in which they sort of take this basic commercial argument and, and make it uh, more and more efficient. And, and that, that, that's how we've gotten to this uh, yeah, so, and eventually to this one over root two plus a little bit of one to the n. By, basically by, by much more advanced uh, little bit offered theorems. But uh, um, I'm not gonna discuss that any further here, because I'm actually already out of, ooh, I'm really out of time. Okay, that, that uh, took up way more time than I wanted. Um, yeah, because what we really wanna do is, is the single value bound. Um, and the single value bound actually follows a similar strategy um, but you just have to have all these error terms, extra error terms. Um, okay, so, um, all right, so for, uh, so for the, the, the least single value bound, so we, we're trying to understand the probability that the least single value is less than some small. Okay, so we're, okay, so we're, we're trying to prove something like this. Okay. So, um, okay, so for the singularity problem, we were asking for vectors x1 through xn to, be, uh, to, to have a linear uh, dependence. Now, uh, it's not quite a linear dependence, but uh, uh, you're asking for the rows of, of, this, of this matrix. Okay, so, so what, what this is asking is that mn x is now small, not zero, but small, for some unit vector, okay. This is the event that we're trying to capture. Um, another way of saying this is that there is some linear combination on, among, say, the, the, uh, the columns. Okay. So that th 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 there is some non-trivial linear relationship of um, combination of these columns, which is not zero, but which is which is small. Okay. Um, and you okay. Again, the, the problem is that you don't know which, for which x this is true. Okay, so that, um, you're trying to bound the event that for some x, for some vector x, some unit vector x, you have a relation of this form. And um, okay, again, if you try to take a union bound right away, you lose, okay? Um, even if you pass to a, to a net, the entropy is, is just too high. And so you need to first cut down the entropy of, 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 of the x's to, to something more reasonable. So um, in the singularity case, we split up into, um, the sparse and non-sparse cases, where so um, if x was very sparse, only epsilon n of, of the entries were non-zero, you could use one sort of argument to, to, to bound this, and you, get a, you got a very good bound. And then uh, when it was not sparse, when, when this linear dependence was non-sparse, you use this, this little bit offered type, type result instead. So it's, it's a similar um, scheme for the um, singular value bound, but just uh, uh, more complicated. Okay, so instead of dividing the sparse and non-sparse, you again divide into these compressible and incompressible uh, vectors. Okay, so uh, now again we pick a small epsilon. Well, in fact, okay, it's just, it's just small epsilon here basically, um, and we, we say we say that a vector x is sparse, uh, so compressible, if it is within epsilon of an epsilon n sparse vector. 
Okay, so it's, 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 it's not completely sparse as it was in the singular case. So you, you allow an error of, of size epsilon, because if you have a unit vector and up to an error of smaller of size left epsilon, it is, it is almost sparse and then incompressible otherwise. Okay, and then it turns out that you can, you can repeat the previous arguments to, to get rid of, of, the, um, of the compressible case fairly easily. So the probability that MNX is small for some compressible x, you can, you can bound with a very good bound. In fact, you can get an exponentially good bound. Um, similarly to, to what happened in the, um, uh, in, in the singularity probability case. And it, it's, it's again a very similar thing. So you have the sparse vector, you can pay an entropy cost, you can assume that, that the sparse vector is at the very beginning. So uh, what this means is, is that the first k rows for some k are almost uh, linearly, uh, linearly um, dependent. That there's only a, a small amount of, of extra, uh, uh, yeah, that, 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 that already the, 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 the first k vectors are already almost independent, and then if you do things properly, um, you, can, you can find some minor of that, of that tall thin matrix, which, which sort of uh, um, spans all, uh, almost spans all the other rows of that, of that thin minor, and you, you again run sort of the same argument uh, that you did before. Um, in doing so, by the way, one of the key facts that you use is that um, is, is, uh, you, know, you, you need a lower bound on the least singular value of a, of a tall thin matrix. Um, you need to know that this tall thin matrix has is, is, is what's called wall condition, that the, up, the upper and lower, um, the largest and smallest singular values are almost uh, comparable, but that's what we did in the first lecture. So you actually used that, that result actually at one point. But anyway, um, you, you, can, you can bound uh, 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 the compressible case just as before, and uh, you can also bound the, um, uh, the incompressible case by, pretty much by, by, by the same method. It's, 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 instead of having a linear dependence, you have to replace every linear dependence by an approximate linear dependence, where you uh, so where some combination of, of of these vectors is not zero but very very small, um, and it turns out, uh, but I think because of lack of time, I, I don't I won't actually do it. Um, it, it. It turns out that that if you do things properly, all the uh, uh, um, all the arguments go through. Um, you need a variant of this little bit offered type uh, type of so. Um, because now there's error terms, you, you're not interested exactly in um, um, random walks being zero, but you're instead interested in random walks being small. So maybe I'll just uh, say one thing. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so what you can use, for example, you can again use a barrier scene type theorem. So the um, the type of bound you want, you, you want is, that, uh, is that if you have a random walk with various steps like this, and you're, ask, you're asking for the probability that this random walk is less than epsilon, um, the, the type of bound you want, uh, as it turns out, is, is that this sort of random walk, um, the concentration probability is something linear in epsilon uh, if these vectors, are, these numbers are in some sense incompressible. Okay, so that they're not all concentrated in, in, in a few entries. So th there's a bound like this which shows up as a substitute for the, for the Erdős bound. Um, and in fact, that's very similar to the bound that's also needed in, in, in the first lecture. So there's a bound like this which, which uh, serves as a substitute for, for the Erdős bound, and that's what eventually gives you um, bounds like this. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, I'm pretty much out of time, so I, I think I will stop here. And on Wednesday, we will start the circle of law. Uh, yeah, it, it is known. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, I forget the exact f formula. Uh, yeah, so so um, so Edelman com computed what the law was in the case of, of, of real Gaussian matrices, and it is known that uh, for real Bernoulli matrices, it, it's the same law. Um, yeah, so that's actually discussed in the notes, but I didn't have time to do it here. Um, the uh, yeah, so it, it's a comparison method. So if you have a Bernoulli matrix and, and a Gaussian matrix. Um, 
it, it turns out that, that the least signal value law is, is universal. Um, and the way you can view that, the way you can see that, is that you can, you can look at the inverses of these matrices. Okay? And the law of the least singular values of these matrices is the same as, as the law of the largest singular values of, of, of these matrices. But the, um, um, so these matrices are pretty ugly. But uh, one nice thing about them is that they're, they're almost finite rank. See, the, um, the spectrum, as I said, you know, um, the spectrum of, of these matrices is sort of roughly equally spaced from all the way from like 1 over root n to, to root n. Okay? And, so, um, and, and the bulk of, of, of the entries have size about the same, same size as, as, the, um, as the operating norm. So it, it, this is very far from being um, low rank. But when you invert it, I'm not, OK. Um, when you invert this picture, um, you know, the least single value goes up to the, OK, so it, 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 the inverse also ranges between 1 over root n and, and n. But most, now the bulk of the eigenvalues are now, are now down here rather than up here. And so in fact, very few of the eigenvalues are of size of root n. And this matrix is almost finite rank. So these are almost finite rank matrices. And um, a key point, so this, by the way, this was done by Van Buren myself. The, um, if you want to understand the operator normal of a finite rank matrix, you can just look at a small minor. You randomly pick a small minor. And, um, and with high probability, the small minor uh, will have an operator normal which is proportional to, 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 uh, to, to, to the full matrix. Um, and so you can, you can look at small minors of, of this matrix. And, 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 and that can actually be understood. And you can show that those are universal, that those don't, don't depend on, 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 the, on, on the entries. Um, so yeah, we, we do actually have a technique for understanding the, the least singular value law. Uh, yeah, so that's discussed in, in the uh, uh, notes, and maybe Nick might talk a little bit about it. I don't know what he's planned uh, um, after this, but uh, 